with me. Is my voice loud enough?
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the second in our podcast series, Can Do Chameleons. The title of today's session is Quality Data, which produces caring and excellent clinical care, in this case, in the field of kidney science. Last week, Professor Richard Cook of the Department of Family Medicine and Primary Care in the School of Clinical Medicine kicked off our series. And today, myself, Catherine Burns, working there and in the Center for Health Science Education and the Adler Museum of Medicine, join you and welcome you all. Thank you for coming to the series. If you've missed the first one, we have a wonderful website where you can go and look up a, as a learning repository about previous podcasts and more detail about our presenters here today. It's at the WITS Where To website, which will be posted in the question and answer section just now. Chameleons have a unique ability. They're able to adapt and change in order to better fit their complex environments. And it is their adaptability in the South African con context that this series seeks to address. Many of the challenges that are impacting the South African healthcare sector can be linked back to health systems indeed, but there are also challenges where we see great opportunities like our two scientists here today. I'll be handing over to our host in a second, but just a little bit about her. Dr. Kurtenia Partha is a biomedical scientist who completed her PhD degree in the middle of the pandemic. She's also a lecturer in health system science in the same department of family medicine and primary care. I now hand over to you, Dr. Partha. Thank you, Catherine, and a warm welcome to you all again. This week's topic focuses on issues of the way in which quality data produces caring and excellent clinical care in the field of clinical science, kidney science, sorry. <laughs> Our speakers are from the African Research and Kidney Disease Consortium, also known as ARC, and will be discussing their research, which looked at kidney function tests and how this affects diagnostics for people in Africa. And we'll be discussing how quality data has impacted their research. I'm joined today by my co-host, Ms. Kizia Mulewa, who is a second year health system scientist student. And our two speakers, Dr. June Fabian, a nephrologist and research director at Fitz Donald Gordon Medical Center, and Dr. Robert Kaliasuba, who is a senior lecturer, nephrologist, and head of Department of Physiology at Makere University College of Health Sciences. Welcome, Drs. Fabian and Kaliasuba. Kizia will first take you through our logistics, after which we will show you a short video of, uh, of the study. In terms of logistics, each speaker will have 10 to 15 minutes to present some ideas, after which we will take the liberty of prompting a discussion between the two speakers. Then we will invite questions and comments in the, from the floor. Please feel free to post comments in, uh, and questions in the Q&A tab. We will now show you the short video. The African Research on Kidney Disease Consortium includes scientists from Malawi, South Africa, Uganda, and the United Kingdom. The burden of kidney disease in many African countries is unknown, partly because we use equations to estimate kidney function development. Sorry, just give us a minute. It's a bit of a technical difficulty on our side. While we are waiting for the video to open up, which we really want you all to see, because in a very few short minutes, as Kat and Kezia will attest, it gives those of us that are not kidney scientists such a rich understanding of the uh, different places where the clinical research was initiated and a really deep understanding of what our colleagues have achieved. Here it is. 
The African Research on Kidney Disease Consortium includes scientists from Malawi, South Africa, Uganda, and the United Kingdom. The burden of kidney disease in many African countries is unknown, partly because we use equations to estimate kidney function developed in well-resourced settings such as Europe and the US. Some equations include race-based adjustments used throughout Africa without us knowing whether they are accurate. In this study, we wanted to understand how best to measure kidney function, evaluate the performance of equations, and estimate the prevalence of kidney disease in African populations. Study sites are embedded in communities with whom we have built strong relationships over many years. Field workers visited people in their homes, asking whether they would be interested in the study. We explained what the study would involve and invited participants to join us in our research clinics. With rigorous ethical and scientific oversight, we ensured consistency across all sites, aiming to recruit 1,000 adults from each country. Participants were screened on arrival to ensure it was safe to give IOHEXEL. Trained nurses used sterile technique to establish intravenous access in both arms. IOHEXEL was administered as a single intravenous dose in one arm. The other arm was used to sample venous blood of IHEXL concentrations at 2, 3, and 4 hours after administration. Samples were processed and stored on site before shipping to a central laboratory for testing. Using plasma excretion of IHEXL as the reference for kidney function, the black graph, we compared performance of numerous estimating equations. All creatinine-based equations overestimated kidney function, falling to the right of the black graph, and cystatin C-based equations better approximated the IHEXL reference, red graph. With population data sets from West, East, and Southern Africa, we use the IHEXL reference to predict kidney disease prevalence, bar graph on the right, and compare this to the prevalence using the currently recommended equation, bar graph on the left. Our results suggest kidney disease prevalence may be substantially higher in Africa than previously thought, increasing from about 1 in 30 to 1 in 8 people. Okay, thank you for that wonderful video. So now that we've piqued your interest in this study, um, I think for myself, it was hearing one in 30 to one in eight. That's crazy. Um, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Robert. The floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Katie. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be able to share with you our findings and talk about uh, good data and how it counts. Um, I'll first share with you my personal story on how I ended up doing part of this study. I was born in a small village in Nakaseke in Uganda, which is about 65 kilometers from the main capital. And at the age of seven, I got separated from my parents. And uh, my dad actually passed away in the war. So I had dropped out of school and uh, some good Samaritans were able to educate me through up to university, up to where I am today. Of course, through my life, I've faced a lot of challenges. And so I thought challenges were not unique to me or new. But when we conducted this study, I found another sort of challenges, which I will 
walk us through. So uh, today's talk is about data and good data and the importance of good data. So when we go out to do research, it's very important that our data is very accurate and credible. To do this, we require a lot of planning uh, from the earlier stages. And that's why it's important that we have rigorous review from the ethics and uh, research groups. But of course, these are not enough to prepare us for the real work. Good data would require a credible amount of effort in the planning, execution, and analysis to make sure that errors are minimized. Uh, if you are to get um, published in good journals, the data should be dependable and ideally should have an end benefit of improving patient outcomes and perhaps change some existing uh, dogmas and science. In our case, we knew that uh, we, we, we hypothesized that uh, creatinine was not a good measure and um, we needed to do something about it, particularly for the African population. And uh, we set out to do this study, but it, it was a much harder job than we had earlier thought. And so it's important that when you set out to get the data, you should have the flexibility to be able to learn new things. And um, the main critical issues around the measurements. For example, we have a commonly measured um, biomarker called creatinine, which is routinely used in the world. And we use it in clinical practice without any question. But when it came to the study, we actually realized that we had two ways of measuring the creatinine and one called the Jaffe and the other one, the enzymatic method. So in two of the countries, we used uh, the Jaffe and in, in one, we used the enzymatic method. So when it came to analysis, we actually had to reconcile these two. And actually we, we had to use a lot of science to do that. Uh, but luckily we had made sure that all our creatinine measurements were taken according to international standards. And so the correction factor became much easier. In the same way, one of the markers we used was actually cystatine. Cystatine can be quite unstable and so, through our discussions, we actually decided that all cystatins would be bashed up and analyzed at the end of the study, which actually also improved our uh, data accuracy. Of course, having done this big study uh, for the first time in Sub-Saharan Africa, we had to do a lot of preparation. And uh, part of what we did, initially we planned to do the study in Uganda and Malawi, but we later learned that our colleagues from South Africa were undertaking um, the same study. And uh, through working with teams from the London School, we are able to come together through the African Research on Kidney Disease Consortium. And from that time, we continued working together. We held several meetings and also got to know each other um, individually and on an individual basis, which I think when the times became tough, having known each other, met physically, because at the earlier stages, COVID was not there. This kept us going. Through this piece, we are also able to realize the strength of each of, our, of the partners. For instance, when we visited South Africa, we noted that they had a very good lab that could actually analyze IOXO, we, IOXO which is the compound that we use to measure kidney function. Earlier, we had planned that we are going to have this capacity developed in Uganda. And we had actually planned to buy the, the, the state-of-the-art machine called the HPLC machine. But when we visited South Africa physically and saw the rigorous work that needed to be done to get the IOXO in place, as a team, we agreed that we should all do the IOX analysis from South Africa. So that was a, a, a big learning. And we are fortunate that our funders we are also listening to us. So we ended up doing all the IXO analysis from South Africa. And so this again speaks to good data because you have to make choices at all time. And uh, you need to also use the right tools. 
part of the meetings we did were to standardize all our, all our correcting tools across the three countries to ensure that we are all correcting the same thing. This took a while, but in the end, we, when it came to analysis, we all had a similar data, which made it a little easier for the analysis to be conducted. Of course, there were some delays, for instance, IOXO, which is readily common in countries used for radiology imaging. We had to wait about three months to get it in country, and yet it's a very available commodity. So in the research, getting good data also requires us to be patient. There are also some myths that are held and can be carried on as real dogma. And this get institutionalized and may be hard to change, and in some instances become an indirect to science. Of course, when we, we, we set out to do the study, the hypothesis was good, but when our results came back, we had the challenge of making sure that we get this presented. And uh, being that we are from low resource countries, had its toll, toll on us. For instance, we received a lot of critique that probably would not have been received if this paper was coming from high income countries. And this was particularly because um, we did not conform to the known standards. Most the developed formulas have been widely accepted and used without discrimination, even in the African countries, yet they had had very little validation. And so when our results came and we are disputing this, we got a lot of pushback from the reviewers. Uh, in fact, earlier on, uh, we had done some work in Uganda looking at the mortality paper, uh, looking at mortality uh, from kidney disease. This was to be published in the British Journal. And uh, actually one of the reviewers wrote that our paper should be reviewed by an English speaking person. And yet six of our co-authors were professors from the London School who are natives of London. But because I guess I was the corresponding author, some of these things come across routinely. But we are fortunate that our data was robust. And uh, as June will be sharing, we ensured that we kept it as such. Of course, also there are other challenges that come with coming from low-income countries. And as a researcher, you should be willing and um, uh, put up a good fight for this. Uh, and sometimes it's because it's just that the world is unfair. As another example, I was not able to attain my graduation for the PhD, despite having been to London five times with the very active visas. My last visa was delayed and I was not able to go to the graduation yet I applied um, uh, four weeks earlier. So some of these things come up and we should be ready as scientists from low resource limited settings to be able to challenge and face them. Um, the other issue I would want to talk about data is that, of course, when you, are, when you are going to do research, you should always hold your horses strong. We knew that what we are doing was we expected what we found, but when we found it, we are also surprised ourselves. Of course, there is a, a use as the video has shown of the equations. This overestimate the GFR by 16 to 18%. And so when we found our data and it showed that clearly this was the case, um, it became very important that this was presented in a good way. And so, we are able to demonstrate that really the coefficient made the kidney function worse in our settings. And uh, of course, this had to take a lot of challenge, especially in terms of the race, which was not actually believed initially. We were rejected by several journals, but as June will be sharing with you, we finally had to publish. Again, I would say that once you've done uh, research very well and you follow all the procedures and you enlist the support of experts like the multidisciplinary team we had, this data will always stand the test of time. No matter who comes against it, it can always speak for itself. And in the end, our paper got published 
And that's why we are here today to share with you part of the information we found. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Robert, for your wonderful talk. That was actually quite interesting. I would like to hand over to June. Thanks everyone for asking me to share my experiences today. Um, Robert and I have both been asked to share the story behind the story, which I hope we will be able to do and to weave in our personal stories. So this will be a personal reflection of mine. I also just want to say that although the focus is on Robert and I in this podcast, there are literally hundreds of people that contributed in critical ways to the success of the project. And I can't emphasize more how a project like this doesn't take a village, it takes many, many villages. And um, I'm always very mindful that critical members of the team aren't forgotten. And I just want to say again today, thank you to, to every single person. So as an example, we screened a young woman when um, she was on our study and she had a glucose of 36 and she couldn't see and she was trying to study for her exams. And unbeknown to me, they didn't have any money and the team chipped in and took her to a nearby hospital and make sure, made sure that she got care after she had sat at a clinic for six hours waiting for an ambulance. And they didn't tell me that. When I saw the participant, she told me what the team had done. So it's things like that, that are the human sides of our stories that we, if we don't see it, um, our team does it all the time and they do it with love and with a commitment that is sometimes incredibly moving, especially when a project like this sometimes feels overwhelming. So the team would say to me, they used to call me Junie, they used to say, Junie, just take a break and come back in a couple of hours and um, we'll sort this out. And often they did. So our learning is mutual. Um, it's not just about the science, it's from each other and it's from the communities um, that hosted us for the project. So personally, um, how did I get here? I always wanted to be a doctor, even from when I was small, but I was persuaded by my father to do pharmacy because it was a good career for a woman. And from my first year, I went to see a professor at Wits and he said, Ach, we aren't looking for any converts, just stay where you are. So I completed pharmacy and then I applied for medicine. And as an older student, we were called the golden girls, but I was funding the degree myself. I had two part-time jobs and I took out a loan, but I was very clear about why I was there and I wanted to know more. Having said that, I was bitterly disappointed when I got to pathology. And I suddenly realized what the category of etiology unknown became. And naively, I couldn't comprehend that huge chunks of our practice was informed by things that we didn't know. And in 2000, our graduate class was the first to do community service. And we went to Tinswale Hospital in Bushbuck Ridge. And after that, I headed back to Johannesburg, really hungry for some specialist training because again, I was asking why there were so many knowledge gaps in South Africa and I wanted to learn more. But without quality data of our own, we were importing concepts, practice, teachings from the global north with little interrogation. And we compromised ourselves through that. We compromised our students who would be our successors and those in our personal care and also policies that impact population health. And we also compromised our global impact. So while I knew that we needed quality data and I knew what questions to ask, I had no idea how to get there. Until I had a conversation with Professor Khan in the School of Public Health one Friday afternoon, and she said, let's apply for a grant. And I thought, well, what are the odds? But we got the grant. And suddenly I realized that I had to commit to doing my PhD. And as Robert said, they had also applied for the grant and we were all trying to do the same thing. So we were asked to work together. And from then on, my experience was a vertical trajectory of learning. I knew the clinical stuff, but I had no knowledge really of epidemiology, population health, complex statistical modeling, and I constantly felt out of my depth. Life also happened to us. My mother had a stroke in the first year of my PhD. My father died in the last year. 
And when COVID hit us, our team literally dispersed across the globe. We had people moving from Malawi to Glasgow, from Uganda to Denmark. Many of us got COVID. There were huge lulls in our work because we couldn't meet because some of us were sick. And Robert was at the London School when COVID hit us. And when he got back to Kampala, he was incarcerated in a hotel for six weeks away from his family with no explanation and no testing. And he sat there until the MRC unit in Uganda intervened to get him out of the, hospital, out of the hotel. So having that as our background, I think what we've learned is that we need to understand how to generate quality data. Because we did everything possible, and I really mean that, to ensure that we generated quality data. We knew we were fighting the odds that huge consortia in high income settings don't ever have to contemplate. As an example, studies in the US pool data from thousands of people in numerous cohorts of people with kidney disease, many of whom are on dialysis. There are no such cohorts in Africa. In our three study sites, there is no access to dialysis. So if you have renal failure, you will die. And that's why we couldn't find people with low GFRs to recruit to our study, which is one of the criticisms of our paper. We also had to train our staff on how to perform a test they'd never had to do in their lives, as opposed to centers in Europe where they have dedicated staff whose job it is to do these tests every day. So it goes without saying that we made mistakes. Uganda started first and we fine tuned the process. We minimized mistakes in South Africa and Malawi, but every site still makes mistakes in every study. It happens irrespective of the setting, irrespective of how hard you try. And oftentimes you only know that you made a mistake when you get the data, so you can't fix it in real time. Understanding the quality of your data matters. So initially our focus was on doing it right. We were doing it prospectively, we'd met we had a laboratory oversight committee meeting. We had protocol oversights. We, and then we met in Uganda in November 2019 to take a preliminary look at the data. And as Robert alluded to, in a strange way, we had all hypothesized quite correctly about what we were going to find. But when we saw the data for the first time, it was mind blowing, it was thrilling, and it was terrifying. Our overriding sense was that no one is going to believe us. And we spent two years, and I mean two years, meeting every week to ensure that we hadn't made a mistake somewhere. We set up internal meetings with our senior scientists to review the data. We asked external experts to look at our data and review it and give us feedback. And during this process, I became intimately entwined with the data. I lived it, I slept it, I dreamt it, I thought about it, I read what others found, I read it again, I cross-checked and we cross-checked our data again. I became obsessed with understanding what we'd found and why it was different. And after looking at it every which way we could, the question to all of us was, do we believe it? So believing the quality of your data matters. We knew we were going to get pushback. We were challenging a three decade dogma perpetuated by some of the biggest names in US nephrology. We were saying creatinine did badly, so did the equations, and that race-based African-American coefficients should be scrapped. And this banished the race-based approach to diagnosing kidney disease, which has a huge impact in the lives of African-American people. Again, naively, I thought surely it was about the science about how 1.4 billion people have been compromised through the absence of our own good science. So why wouldn't someone want to publish it? So we submitted to the NEJM on the 30th of April, and I received the following. It's the terrible Dear John letter. Dear Dr. Fabian, your paper was evaluated by external reviewers and discussed amongst the editors. Although it's interesting, I'm sorry to say it wasn't accepted for publication. So we submitted a letter of appeal, and on the 19th of May, we received the following. Dear Dr. Fabian, I discussed your concerns. While we cannot promise that a resubmission will fare better than your first submission, nor even be sent for peer review, we are willing to consider a revised version of the manuscript. That being said, I think it's best for us to add the following. Given the work it takes to resubmit, 
we have concerns and also felt during discussion that a better home for the work, to be frank, is a nephrology journal. We agree with you that this is an important topic and a laudable effort, which adds important information, but your results are not definitive in our view and that of the reviewers. We feel that you have not excluded methodological or population selection as, as, as the explanation for your findings. Your methods were inadequately described. Your results were not concisely presented and your discussion does not explain your findings. In spite of this feedback, we decided to resubmit and we were given three months from the 30th of May. We had intermittent communication with the editor and we had to address numerous comments and we had to run multiple analyses. And because of that, we asked for a one month reprieve just as we were about to resubmit the paper. On the 17th of September, the NEJM published an article from the US team titled New Creatinine and Cystatin C-Based Equations to Estimate GFR Without Race, with an editorial written by the very same editor who told us our work would be better placed in a nephrology journal. Needless to say, we were gutted. Everyone says, don't take it personally, but hell, I took it personally. And as Robert succinctly summarized, it felt like a betrayal of the science. We then, then submitted to Lancet, we were bumped to Lancet Global Health, and they sent the paper out not to one or two reviewers, but to six reviewers, and they asked for a full statistical review. Three agonizing months later, our publication was accepted. Our paper is the only, of it, only one of its kind in the field to make our entire data set available in the public domain. And part of making the data available is to invite peer review, to allow others to access our methods, our statistical code and our data to accelerate their own science and ideally improve on ours. Quality data matters because it will stand external review and it will stand the test of time and fighting for its recognition matters. So after the paper was accepted, we realized the importance of making it accessible to many more than a handful of GFR global specialists. We had always wanted to make a video and took photos and video footage during the project. Teasing out the important messages was really hard, again, realizing that quality data doesn't matter if you can't make it accessible. This is a skill in and of itself and one none of us are trained for, posing important questions that extend beyond just knowing and understanding and opening the debate for what our responsibilities are as scientists in the health space and how far our resp responsibilities extend to engaging key stakeholders and policymakers. And I think I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, June. Um, you know, I think the first part for me is, is how moving it was to hear the human side of your study. You know, as scientists, you often forget the human side while doing the science. And it was lovely to be reminded of this again. And secondly, thank you so much for highlighting why quality data matters. I think by, by going through the difficulties you faced, I think a lot of us on this call were, were shocked to hear some of the difficulties you faced. Um, and, and thank you for going through it in such detail so we were able to relate to it. Um, you know, we're, we're going to take a few questions now from our, from our audience that's here and I think um, I'll go through the chat. So the first question, um, it says, thank you for this work. Please can the two researchers say something about how to stay motivated as Southern researchers? So um, June, I'll hand over to you and then we can hand over to Robert. Yeah, it's an interesting question because um, I think there is a sense of betrayal when you know that your story is good and the science should be out there. But I think it's a lot around who's around you. Um, and we did pick each other up and we did pull each other along. So I think it's about staying committed to what you know is the truth and the importance of putting it out there, but it's also having a team of people around you and each of you pull when the other one's lagging a bit, but I'll let Robert talk as well.
Thank you, John, and thank you, Kurt. That's a wonderful question. I hope we did not paint uh, the picture of uh, to be very grim. I think you see in the end, we got our work published in a very good journal. So I hope that the young scientists don't go away demotivated. We, uh, between us, we have over a hundred publications, a hundred and I think 20 to be clear, between me and June alone. So it's not like publication is new to us, but perhaps sometimes we aim too low. And if you are afraid, you might not go to the higher journals. And it's important to appreciate that these inequalities exist. There's an effort to try and fight them now. I think some of it might be lip service, but at least every university is trying to do this. So I hope that for your generation who are young, it's going to get better. And we, this information we are getting, challenging these dogmas, I think we have enough information to show that once you stick out, this can work. So I think part of the things that kept us going, as June said, is teamwork. And as I alluded to earlier, we are very fortunate because we also had meetings physically. Uh, actually, June said to me, I'm high young brother uh, in one of the sessions earlier on. And we, we've had very strong mentors with code expert. Lori Tomlinson is like a, um, a sister to us, though she's our mentor. And we, we share very freely. So when these times came, uh, we would always have the back of each other. And then the other thing, as Juna said, is because we knew what we had done was really right. In fact, as she said, if you look at our appendix, it's over 80 pages, just explaining the details of what we did to make sure that this data works. You won't find this anywhere. In fact, we, it took us a long time through the meetings because we had to consult over uh, 20 consultants and each of for these small pity bits. And sometimes you'd send an email and no one responds to it. But when you get the right person to, be, to send the email in hours, it gets responded to. So you also have to know the, 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 the science, I would call it maybe sociology behind the science that you get the right people to ask uh, for some of these things. And then the, the other issue, we that kept us going as uh, young scientists was because of what we stood for. We are representing a different population which had been lumped up. And I, I told my team that, you know, people from Africa are not small black Americans. They are actually Africans and they have their own um, distinguishing characteristics. And if these get lumped up and we don't speak for them, then it can easily be lost and we continue to do the wrong things, which has consequences as June shared. So these are some of the things that motivated us and we kept going. And so for young people, it's good not to do research alone. You should always have mentors. You should be willing to ask when you don't know. Most people are actually willing to help once you ask. And that actually kept us going. Thank you very much. Thank you, June, and thank you, Robert, for that. Um, I completely agree with you. Ask for help. Um, ask those above you and find a mentor. Um, our next question, um, or well, it starts with many thanks to the speakers and the wonderful job they are doing. The question on her side is, sorry, anonymous. So the question on my side is, what is the link between living with HIV and being on ARVs and kidney disease? And I'm, I'm assuming the second part of that, I'm just going to add it for myself, is how do you think this would impact your study? Um, June or Robert, whoever would like to go first. Robert, do you want to answer that? Mick both did, I guess, but yeah. I think June, you, we alluded to this in our paper. And now we know that some of the things that might actually need to be considered differently are particular diseases. We have particular diseases in kidney disease that are peculiar or are more prevalent in our setting. And so HIV is one of them. HIV, of course, can affect the kidney in many ways. It can be through the direct effect of HIV, particularly when the viral load is high. 
and the CD4 is low. So the HIV causes direct injury to the kidneys by invading through receptors and injuring the kidney. The other way, of course, HIV affects the kidneys through opportunistic infections. Once people's immune system drops, they get a lot of opportunistic infections, including TB, cryptococcal meningitis, uh, cytomegalovirus, and most of these other infections that can actually hit the kidney directly. And then the third thing is around the drugs that are used to treat HIV themselves. We have drugs like tenofovir, and earlier on, we are using drugs like uh, the protease inhibitors. This can cause stones uh, like atazanavir in the kidney. And then the drugs that treat opportunistic infection themselves can directly uh, affect the kidney. Or sometimes a drug like Bactrim or Septrin for some of our countries actually interferes with the marker, the creatinine. It can actually interfere with the secretion of the creatinine. So, True, some of these things could actually be the reasons why maybe creatinine does not work very well in these individuals. So in order for you to have good measurements in these people, you need to look at, uh, to correct for their body surface area, which is critical, but also it's important to appreciate that these people, of course, as June might say, and I hope she speaks to this because she's the expert of HIV, these people might also have less muscle mass and therefore would produce less creatinine. The recommendation in this case would be is that you don't use one marker. This is an instance where you might use another marker like cystatin because for it, it is not affected by the body muscle mass and might not be affected by all the other parameters that uh, creatinine is affected by. And so you need to put this into consideration. Of course, it will come at a cost, but if you are practicing with one person in front of you, I think making the right diagnosis is more cost effective than delaying the treatment of these patients who might actually eventually die if they are not taken care of. So I think HIV presents a unique, um, a, a unique presentation and we have much more of it in our setting. And as you saw in our paper, I think in South Africa, in some areas, it was up to 23, and most of us were above nine. So it's really, really common, and people in the developed countries don't have this kind of problem. June, you might want to add a little more. <laughs> no, I think you did a great job, Robert. Um, I think just in terms of the last point, we did find different prevalences in the different countries. And what we did find in our South African women is the prevalence was double that of South African men in Agincourt. So men are about 12% HIV positive in Bushbuck Ridge and women were almost 24%. The problem with that is that the women in South Africa tended to have really low creatinines. And we don't know if that's an effect of the antiretrovirals because some of the antiretrovirals do promote tubule excretion of creatinine which kind of loops back to the point that Robert was saying is that perhaps in the setting of HIV with certain antiretrovirals, we should be looking at cystatin C. But yeah, I don't have anything else to add. Thank you very much, Robert and Jean. Our next question um, starts with, thank you very much for this great work. Truly worth acknowledgement. I would like to ask, considering the massive study from an ethics point of view, was it possible to obtain consent from all these community members involved? If so, can we say it was reasonably trusted that they truly understood what they were consenting to? Um, June, I'm gonna let you start. <laughs> There's no way we would have been able to cons you know, get anyone to participate if we didn't have a proper consent. Um, what I did learn in Bushback Ridge is that consent is a very different thing. And Robert, you can speak to how it works in um, Uganda. But what I realized when I got my sample in Bushbuck Ridge is that they gave me the name of the head of the household. And I was like, but why would you do that? I want the name of the participant. And in true style, they just smiled at me and said, you should go to the home and find out. But what happens is there's a whole approach to the household. Uh, if you are welcome, you get asked to sit and the family will come and the head of the household actually decides whether the participant will be part of the study or not. So I did kind of agonize over the whole consenting process because we have a very individualistic approach, but it's very different um, 
in the study that we did. The whole family's there while you're being tested for HIV. <laughs> um, it's very open. Um, and often the participants would say to us, but my mother's already said I must be in the study. So why are you asking me to, to do the whole consent thing? So I think consent is different. Um, I think the way we approach it in our very traditional kind of individualistic approach is problematic, but there is nobody that would have ever been consented um, or participated without understanding. Um, the consent is done by field workers who speak Shangan, for example, in Bushbuck Ridge. And there's a whole process of what we call public engagement that happens before the study. So when we know that there's a study that's coming to the site, there are people from the community who work in Agincourt who are part of the public engagement office. They have a system of meeting with the Indunas and with community advisory board members, and they talk to people about the study. They also have meetings in the community explaining what the study is about, explaining what we're trying to do. All of that happens at Induna level, at community advisory board level, and then within the communities before we even start the project. So I think in answer to your question, can I safely say that I think people understood what they were participating in? I can. We also took a month at the end of the study to give each individual participant their own study results because part of the criticism when we did speak to the community is they said to us, we don't want you to come here and just tell us what you found overall. I want to know what my kidney function is. I want to know what my glucose is. I want to know what my blood pressure is. So in the database that we used to collect the data, we were able to generate a form for each individual participant that auto-populated their own results. And our field team went back to their homes and gave them that form. So I think your point is well taken. I think studies can miss the community but I think we really did try not to miss the community, but um, there are always gaps and there are mistakes that we make inadvertently. So Robert, I don't know if you want to add anything. It's very hard to speak after you do. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess we, <laughs> we, have, we, we had a community advisory board and um, it was, I, I was fortunate that um, I, at that time I was actually one of three nephrologists in the country of about 40 million people. So I would go to the field myself and everyone, actually for us, we had many more people wanting to participate in the study after they understood what the study was about. We actually had a harder time explaining to them that this has to be random. And so, those who, who were selected, we are uh, very grateful to participate. And for this study, we actually had more than three consents. Um, this study was reviewed. We had to have consent to participate. We had to take a log that people had understood. We also had to take uh, uh, consents, in separate consents for blood draws, and then separate consents for uh, blood and uh, specimen storage and future use, and all of these had to have very thorough explanations. And so people uh, got uh, to understand, and as June said, they actually had to ask for their individual results, and uh, we, we made sure that they totally understood. So for that, we did a very good job, and uh, they're actually now asking us to go back and do more. They, they want to, to learn more about kidneys and how they can improve uh, the outcome. So thank you. Thank you both. So just an add on to that, um, I think. So the next question starts with such powerful presentations from you both. How do you see the way forward unfolding regarding implications for clinical care, gu guideline changes, or at least the conversations being taken forward in a constructive way? Robert, I'll, I'll let you start this time. You, you want me to start? Yes, yes. that's, yeah, that, of course, I, I as, as we've, we've told you, our research has listed more questions than answers, and we keep getting that question. The truth is that we really don't know how to move forward, but we'll have, we have some suggestions. 
I think one of the things that is going to hinder this is that the, the creatinine, which is a cheaper marker and readily available, has been so institutionalized that either intentionally or indirectly or because of profit marking, people are not willing to move on. And so sometimes I think it is the lack, the inertia from the scientists themselves. It is not the first time that we found that cystatin C is actually a beta marker uh, in uh, depicting kidney function. This has been established even in, in the high income countries, but the cost of uh, cystatin C is around three times that of creatinine. But I think what we should move on with is that because cystatin C is expensive, we should look at certain categories of people where creatinine can be used, and then in others where cystatin C should ideally be used. And I think Juna has published on this. There are ways we can make this more accessible and cheaper by having point of care tests uh, for some of these tests like cystatin C so that they don't all have to go to the central lab. And this should be embedded within the guidelines. And because we have really, if you saw in the movie, the cystatin C almost virtually mirrors the, the IOXO at all levels of the GFR. And so it is really uh, like a, a golden mark for us. So I'm sure if we pop up the numbers of using cystatin C, like what has happened to the viral load in HIV, uh, if you remember from the CD4, I'm sure the cystatin C will come down and it's still much cheaper than a viral load. You know. We just need to have more advocacy and perhaps use this data we have generated and more people should be able to get access to this. I think that's what I could say for now, but I'm sure June might again have much more. Thank you. No, I agree. Um, I don't have anything to add. I think we need to shift to point of care to do the diagnostics in real time. And I think that's how HIV care shifted. And I think we need to do the same with kidney disease. Thank you very much, both, both of you. Um, so I think we, we have time for maybe two more questions. So um, one of our CHSC interns has asked, what about our non-scientists? Were they trained in health systems um, in potentially anthropology or in project management? And what skills did they need over and above being doctors and scientists if there were no uh, if there were non-scientists involved. Um, June. Okay, I can speak, perhaps Robert can speak to how it was done in, um, in Uganda, but in Bushback Ridge, the agreement with the community is that although the scientists might be imported from elsewhere, for example, myself, we have a commitment to employ people from the community because unemployment is up to 65% in the area. So we invest a lot in training the staff. A lot of them don't necessarily have a matric. Um, we do have trained nurses who have to be trained in terms of research techniques. But a lot of our field workers know the community and learn. Um, and are very willing to learn almost anything so that they can be part of projects. So there's no particular skill set that's required for you to be part of the project other than to pass the training because we have to do quite extensive training to make sure people understand about the project. Um, yeah, and we work with the team all the time to train and make sure that everyone's um, on board and yeah, doing what the project needs. So Robert, I'm not sure how you did it in Uganda. Thank you, Jun. I think you are uh, alluding to the multidisciplinary team also. So actually we were a bit more fortunate in Uganda because we had a, a, a social scientist who has done extensive work in anthropology. And actually they went back to study the process interacting with people, uh, traditional eras, asking them how they were understanding the study. And we have actually published on this. 
understanding kidney disease in rural Uganda. Uh, Professor Siri has actually published this. So we built capacity. We had Professor Siri and three other local anthropologists just going to understand because uh, this was the first time we are doing IOXO studies, keeping people for four hours uh, in one place. And so the, the dynamics that we are going on behind uh, these people were are actually to be explored. But also most importantly is that most of the research in the area involved uh, local leaders. As June said earlier, we have a community advisory board which consists of elders, and um, scientists beyond just uh, medical scientists. We have social workers and social scientists and all other disciplines are actually represented on those committees and things have to be broken down to the simplest language so that they get understood. And the employment for us in Uganda was actually ev almost everyone was uh, locally recruited and we would only ask for the experts that the expertise that we did not have, and it wasn't usually through employment. So we had a, a fair understanding of what was going on and a multidisciplinary team at that. In fact, some more work has to be published with just lay on the anthropology side. We first wanted to get this big paper out and hopefully we'll be sharing more. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to hear how the community was involved in this entire study. Um, so I'm just gonna read a few comments um, that you could probably answer in the Q&A. Um, and it's, it's a lot of, I think, um, people are upset about the editorial part of this. So um, our first says, do editors of journals have to de declare conflicts of interest? Um, our next is congratulations on your work. I think the journals and editors should be exposed for unjust publication biases. And the third says, is there any movement that protects workers against editorial bias? So um, just we're going to leave the Q&A open and you're more than welcome to type an answer to those in there. Um, but I think you can you can feel the anger <laughs> from, from some of our attendees. Um, we'd like to thank you both for making the time coming through and, and giving us a talk about your data, your work, and, and we can really see the impact this will have on our communities, on our African communities. Um, and congratulations. There was a lot of work to get it done. It was a lot of work to get it published. And it is a wonderful study. Um, I've read it, it's really good. Um, and we do have the links to your publication up on the Vitzwo2 site. So please, if our attendees would like to go and see it, please do um, click on the link and you're able to, to view the publication and the video again there as well. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And we will be back next week with, not next week, in two weeks with the next installment of our Can Do Comedians webinar. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Kath, do you want us to stay on or are we done? <laughs> I just would like to congratulate you. Sometimes people stick a question in. I got one <laughs> late one from the CHSE in terms about the cost of the study, but I mm. think that will have to wait for another day about how complex it is, how costly, where we get resources from. And I think that was also linked to the journal discussion that was just getting going. Lots of anger on the WhatsApp groups and empathy <laughs> with both of you, but also taking heart from Robert's comment that you did get it study, uh, get, did get it published in the end. So you were able to rise through that. But thank you to both of you. And um, you'll see that um, you've got two Dr. Pathas here. One of them is actually Professor Richard Cook, and he's showing his face. I'm sure he's also thanking you both. Thank you, colleagues. Robert and June, thank you so much. Uh -huh, hi Richard. <laughs> hi Jim. Nice thank, you. You yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be a co-host. I think I learned a lot, and uh, this was a great experience. Well thank done, you. Kezia. Well done. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Well done. Well done.
Thank you. All right, bye. Okay, thanks, bye. Thank bye. you, bye. And Robert, uh, just to extend an invitation to you, if you ever come to Johannesburg, which I'm sure you will at some point, um, it would be so wonderful to host you over here in the department to take you on a tour of the Adler Museum. It would be wonderful for you to meet Kat and the team, and I'm sure June would be so happy to come across. So please take that as an open invitation from all of us. Thank you very much. This is highly appreciated. Thank you. For and we'll the send you a copy of the podcast too. Thank you very much for the Thank opportunity. You. And thanks so much to you, Veshni, out there for helping us get this all set up beautifully. I forgot to mention your name at the beginning, and we'll put a little special thank you to you in the when we put it up on the website, because you really did a great job, and it was a technically complicated today. So thanks, Veshni, out there, and thanks to Kelly as well for being there in the background, although on another Zoom. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone.